Hello everybody, I'm John Strickland of JLS Consulting. Welcome to our second uh, aviation discussion of this year's World Travel Market Virtual. Uh, some of you, I hope, were able to join us yesterday and uh, maybe with us for the second time today. We're doing head-to-heads with uh, uh, leading industry CEOs, and today we have the leader of one of the largest airlines in the USA. They have around about 260 aircraft. Last year, they flew over 42 million customers. They call themselves New York's hometown airline, and the airline is JetBlue, hence my choice of a blue jacket today uh, to recognize the occasion. And the CEO, the president and CEO of this airline is in fact a Brit, so he truly is an Englishman in New York. I uh, wish I had the song to sing by Sting, but I won't uh, inflict that upon you. So welcome to Robin Hayes. Hey John, great to see you again. Likewise, and uh, just a shame we're not here in, in person, either in Apple or here in London, but at least we managed to do it through this uh, online mechanism. Robin, let's just open up, uh, t- tell the audience a little bit about yourself. You, you are a seasoned airline man. I mean, you've been at, at JetBlue itself for a number of years, but you had a long airline career prior to that uh, with an airline on this side of the Atlantic. Yeah, sure. So, uh, no, thanks. And uh, hello, everyone. And it's uh, great to be with you uh, virtually. Um, sorry, not in uh, person but I think had I come to London for this I probably would have uh, gone to see my team Arsenal play on uh, Sunday and that was not a pretty game uh, losing to Aston Villa so maybe maybe good but then that is revenge because the last time I saw them play Villa in person was actually the FA Cup final we won that one but anyway so um, no, uh, great to be here so yeah I've been in the industry over 30 years I spent most of that at uh, British Airways um, and uh, I joined uh, left BA in uh, 2008 and I came to JetBlue originally as the uh, Chief Commercial Officer based here in New York and uh, um, I've been here for uh, what just over 12 years now so uh, um, it's uh, it's been a great uh, you know it's been a great one for me I love this industry I love all the people in the industry and I you know I love what we do every day. And the airline itself, JetBlue, although, as I said, you, you are a, a massive, you know, one of the leading, I think, top five players uh, uh, by whatever metric you choose to look at within the States, you may not be known to all our viewers today, uh, particularly those who are, are UK-based, mm-hmm. but uh, just uh, give us a, a bit of background. Uh, you, know, uh, you started in 1998, I think, fa- founded by David Neelerman, who's a very well-known right. uh, entrepreneur in the industry. Yeah, so David, uh, David founded JetBlue. You know, he'd credited Morris Air, uh, sold that to Southwest, went to work for Southwest for a period of time uh, and, um, you know, uh, left to start JetBlue. And, uh, you know, David's vision was to create a low cost airline uh, based in New York, because back in the day there was uh, plenty of availability at uh, JFK um, and uh, start an airline that wasn't just about low fares, but also great service. You know, and I think the thing that, is pretty unique for JetBlue and it's not easy to pull off, but we focus on not just offering our customers the best product, but to do it at a very low fare. It means we had to be incredibly efficient uh, and productive, but we've been doing it for over 20 years. And, um, you know, I think uh, we're based here in New York, uh, but we are the largest airline in Boston with the largest airline down in Fort Lauderdale, uh, with the largest airline in uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, we also have, um, uh, what we call focus cities out in uh, Los Angeles and uh, Orlando as well. So uh, that's us. If you haven't flown us, then uh, if you're flying in uh, coach, we call it core. Um, we offer the most legroom of any U.S. airline. Uh, we offer free drinks and snacks, free high-speed Wi-Fi. We're the first airline to offer free high-speed Wi-Fi to all of our customers and uh, 100 uh, up to 100 channels of uh, free live TV and movies. So uh, it really is, I, if I may say, a... Uh, a good experience and uh, we try and keep our fares as low as we can to keep them affordable. And as you said, you have to be lean and mean. We were talking with Michael O'Leary yesterday, who of course is a master of low fares on this side of the Atlantic, and we made a point that anybody can offer low fares, but to do that and actually survive and prosper uh, takes some doing. So we'll we'll look into a bit more about that as we go along, Robin. Just got to remember to uh, let you know, uh, viewers, if you do have any questions, I've got a big list, uh, as you would expect myself, but uh, do put those questions in. I'll try to come to one or two of those later on. And Robin, I'm going to explore with you much more, I hope, uh, in next hour about the business and your your plans but let's just uh, hit the uh, 
regrettable topic that we'll all have to face at the moment and the reason why we're not uh, face to face today, this coronavirus pandemic that hit in March. How has that been playing out for you? Because there are some different experiences, all airlines in the world are suffering, but the US uh, maybe helped in some respects having a large domestic market, but give us a bit of a flavor about where traffic traffic is now and uh, what you've been doing to combat this. Sure, no, uh, thanks, John. And um, look, I mean, for anyone that has worked in this industry, you, we can all agree that this is the most devastating set of events that any of us have ever faced, whether it's in the US or Europe or anywhere else around the world. I mean, we, we saw a business that was performing well, was growing, uh, and suddenly uh, the, the demand just completely disappeared. I mean, when we, when we went into this, um, we had... Um, uh, three objectives as a company. The first one was to make sure our crew members, which is our work for employees and our customers, uh, felt, felt safe to fly. Um, and we put a lot of effort into measures to reassure people that uh, flying was indeed safe. I won't go into all of those because a lot of airlines have done similar things, but we were the first airline in the US to uh, mandate face coverings. Um, and I think that was pivotal in helping more people have confidence to fly. The second thing was to protect our own financial security. So JetBlue came into this with the second strongest balance sheet in the United States. We have spent a lot of time delivering our company and getting us financially healthy. So we had a strong cushion, but uh, we, you know, we were spending that quickly with cash burn back then of you know over 15 million a day. And so we focused on bringing our cash burn down in our Q3 results we just announced a couple of weeks ago. We said our cash burn was down to around $6 million a day. We were very aggressive in raising new forms of liquidity. Uh, one of the good, uh, <laughs> one of the benefits of having a fleet that's largely your own and not, uh, uh, not already leveraged um, against previous debt is we were able to leverage it against debt. So we have plenty of cushion. And then the third, uh, the third thing is what are the sort of disruptives? Whilst we knew we'd be playing a lot of defense, what were the things that we could do to set ourselves up for success longer term to come out of this? Uh, as a better positioned airline. So that's how we uh, went into it. You know, back to your question of the volumes. I mean, back in March or April, we were down to like three, four, five percent. Don't forget, New York was the center of the pandemic at one point. Uh, and then, you know, right now, uh, the US industry, you know, we're back between 30 to 40 percent of normal. Uh, and that's both domestic and what I call close to home international, like the Caribbean that's uh, started to come back as well. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, uh, as you said, several airlines have taken the approach, uh, I think, almost worldwide now in uh, requiring face masks to be worn. Yeah. Uh, as, as this whole pandemic played out, there was a lot of debate about whether middle, she middle seats should be left mm -hmm. free. And of course, it wasn't really an issue initially, because as you said there, the volumes were so low, volumes have recovered. But I think uh, you've said, uh, at least at the moment, you are trying to maintain that middle seat free policy. I, mean, I, I know it's a yeah. moot point whether it makes a big difference, but yeah. you feel at the moment that you can still do that if it's worth doing from a customer point of view. Well, I think, you know, we did it, we did it, uh, we, 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 off, we were doing the middle seat free for a while. Uh, we did announce uh, recently that we would uh, go to uh, caps of 70%. Um, you know, we are finding that as airplanes are getting fuller, um, that it's getting more and more expensive to offer it. And I think the other thing that's changed since the early days is that there's been a number of scientific studies, whether that's the Department of Defense, uh, the Harvard um, uh, uh, Harvard uh, University, uh, Airbus and Boeing, there's been a number of uh, scientific surveys that just mm -hmm. point to how safe the airplane is. And so, um, you know, our view is that uh, middle, the, the issue of middle seats has uh, been largely one of customer perception now. Uh, and uh, because they're so expensive, it's not something that we see we can sustain uh, for long term. So we're committed uh, through to uh, the end of uh, the month, of December 1, at just under 70%. And then uh, we'll share shortly what we're thinking, uh, to, uh, what we're thinking of doing uh, after that. Let's just link this in. Uh, you mentioned you, you had your third quarter financial results out only uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you, not surprisingly, had a big loss, but the company's been... Uh, pretty uh, substantially profitable uh, in, in recent years. I don't have the detail right the way back, but uh, I guess you've been pretty true to the, the principles of uh, low cost. I think 
a key point you mentioned is having that buffer of cash. This is something that Michael O'Leary said yesterday. You know, they've got a big buffer of cash because it's not common, is it? You know, most airline brethren have maybe weeks or a few months of cash at best. Some have had to turn to support from uh, governments or shareholders. Yeah. But uh, you, you've got that big buffer. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we came into this, um, you know, we came into this with cash. We came into this with plenty of ability to uh, borrow against our assets, uh, which we did. You know, I think the Federal Reserve did a very good job in the U.S. in terms of, in terms of keeping liquidity in the market. Uh, we and all the U.S. airlines were also um, a tremendous beneficiary of uh, the uh, Trump administration's uh, uh, focus on the CARES Act in terms mm -hmm. of a full-based stimulus bill that airlines benefited from. And then we had good bipartisan support from both Democrats and Republicans to get that passed into law. So again, the CARES Act was a great example, I think, in the US of bipartisan um, compromise and, and working together. You know, one always focuses on the, the differences, particularly at the moment. But, um, you know, they everyone came together, we got that done. And, and that really helped us uh, and helped the industry avoid furloughs for a significant uh, period of time. And in terms of your, your, your network and the flying, as you said, I don't know what the ratio is, uh, I'll ask you to tell us in a moment, but between the domestic or the closer to home right. international, but we've seen in many parts of the world where there has been a recovery or at least some sustained traffic, it has been weighted towards domestic travel, where at least there is not that aggravating element of uh, border closures or quarantine questions and the uncertainty we've seen uh, around that. Uh, but also, uh, your, your mix of traffic, I've read, perhaps um, is better suited to it. You have a lot of VFR traffic, you have a lot of uh, leisure traffic, and a much lower ratio of business travel, which of course has perhaps been hit the most, where business is not traveling at all at the moment. Yeah, so we are roughly, we're about 70% of our capacity is domestic, about 30% mm -hmm. is international. Right. International is a mix of Caribbean and Latin America, and we're about 80% leisure and 20% business. I do, one of the uh, challenges though, is the domestic, even though uh, you would think domestic travel would be easy, we have seen a number of states in the US put travel quarantines in. So right, okay. whilst it may not be flying internationally, you know, some of the same challenges that the industry has seen in the UK, for example, with the 14 day quarantine, uh, we've had the same issues here. Uh, the rules are inconsistent. Every state does it differently. Compliance of uh, with the quarantines is poor. Um, and so it's been a very, I think, confusing set of events for travelers. And so that does put, you know, people, some people off. So we, we have seen some of that friction uh, here as well um, as, uh, you know, you've seen internationally. I mean, I mean that's one of the challenges. Again, I'm asking everybody I speak to in the industry right now, but uh, we see, you've just explained the complication that uh, exists within the states, the federal nature of the states having their own powers. We see between countries here in the UK, you know, on off quarantines and differences all around Europe and very last minute decisions. Do you think there's any better way uh, of getting the industry as a whole? whatever its members, airlines, airports, manufacturers, to somehow get the message over uh, that aviation is as important as we all know it is uh, and to try to have a, a, a more cooperative approach between governments and the industry, as we see within the industry itself, to, to get us back in the right direction. No, definitely. I mean, I think, um, um, you know, we, our Global Trade Association is IATA, you know, mm -hmm. IATA working with ICAO, which is the sort of uh, nation, all the nation states um, that airlines fly to, you know, coming, trying to get everyone to agree a common framework of how to approach this would be immensely beneficial. The, the problem is, though, I think unique to what happens with the coronavirus. So, um, you know, as you start to get community spread in any community or country, the numbers can start growing up growing quickly, governments, public health officials become concerned about the healthcare system being overrun. They put measures in place, some of which work and some of which don't, um, to try to reduce that. And I think, you know, travel in the early days was seen as a, a source of how the virus moved around the world. And, you know, that's probably true, right? I mean, the virus emanated in China and went from China to different countries, clearly. So I think aviation, because of that, has always been uh, viewed uh, skeptically and you know part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution and so i think you know as we get further into this as we better understand 
what measures are um, working in terms of uh, reducing coronavirus spread and what do cause what cause a lot of disruption but don't really uh, help. You know, I think we can get smarter as an industry. We can get smarter as a global uh, community. Um, I mean, even uh, I'll give you an example here in New York where there is a quarantine. We have 750,000 kids coming back from all over the country into New York State for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, and a 14-day quarantine in itself doesn't necessarily help that because you don't know if you're positive or not. You go home, you're probably, uh, if you're, if, even if you comply with uh, quarantine, and I make no comment on how, well, college kids, we think will comply with quarantine, and I have one. Um, but, um, but even if you do comply, you're at home with family. Uh, if you have coronavirus, you could transmit it, and suddenly you've got a lot more community spread. So testing is a better answer than uh-huh. just quarantine. So New York State, to their credit, rolled out a couple of weeks ago a testing alternative um, so that if you test uh, and you get two negative tests, uh, then you can come out of quarantine. It gives people incentive to get tested, to come out of quarantine. And I think it's going to improve compliance because most people look at that and say, that's a more reasonable alternative. So it's safer. Uh, and I think it helps people um, work through some of the friction points. And it means that you then have more people that can start doing things and contributing to economic activity again. And you specifically have been talking or, or promoting um, at home COVID testing, haven't you? And again, Michael Leary was strongly the view that this should be done before departure and it should be done even before getting to the airport. Because, of course, when airports are empty, you could theoretically do it there, but as long yeah. as you, you can't. Uh, yeah. Is that something that's a, a kind of a carrier specific uh, concept that you're, you're, you're fostering, Robin? Yeah, so, you know, we, like other airlines, are very focused on this issue. You know, we do think testing is a important part of how the industry uh, steps out of this. Uh, but we have to be thoughtful. I mean, here's, here's, here's the challenge, as I see it. The, the, if the travel industry doesn't work together on this, um, every company that you will be um, looking to use on a vacation, for example, is going to have their own rules. Like, you know, I go and check into my airline. They're going to want some form of proof of test. Or when I where I land, they're going to want some form of proof of test. I go and check into my hotel. I go to the amusement park. You know, everyone is looking to build these things individually. And I think that the the secret source is how how can we create something that um, we can all use. So a customer maybe goes and gets a test in their local pharmacy before they go. Um, it gets uploaded onto an app and then they can use that throughout their whole travel experience. The cost of testing is also going to come down. So PCR testing, which is, you know, most of what uh, people are using at the moment is around $100, $150 here in the US for a test. What you're seeing is antigen testing coming very quickly, which is going to significantly reduce that price point. So not only would it be cheaper to either go to your pharmacy and do it or a, a home test, or even a test at the airport, if for those that haven't done it. Um, the ac- so the cost of those antigen tests are coming down. The accuracy of those antigen tests is going up. So, you know, I think we're getting to a point here, and it you know, probably isn't until uh, 2021, um, where I think that this level of low-cost, highly accurate antigen jet testing could be widely available. And I think that would be a huge bonus for the travel industry and in starting to open up again. But, yeah, so we partnered with a company called Vault at the moment, uh, it's a it's a PCR test. It's home based, um, but it's been extremely uh, uh, helpful in terms of giving customers another alternative. Well, you know, thanks, Robin. It's certainly something we're going to have to live with uh, for quite some time ahead. And even the vaccine, we had this good news about Pfizer uh, yesterday, the day before. But I guess we're very early days on that, so we shouldn't get uh, too uh, ebullient and uh, excited so far. Let's move on from this. Uh, uh, unfortunate, but you know, very present topic, uh, Robin, to, to look more at the commercial uh, makeup of JetBlue and your network and so on. Just just briefly on competition, I mean, we, we've got to what five or six uh, major carriers in the USA. You've got the three big network carriers: uh, American, uh, Delta, and United, and then three, which I guess you put under the low cost bracket. In, in that bracket, uh, looking at yourselves, Southwest, who of course were the founders, if you like, of a low-cost concept, and more recently Spirit, who perhaps look more like, maybe I'm wrong, but more of a bargain basement, very price-led and uh, basic service, perhaps fitting the Ryanair mold. The three low-costs are quite different. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Where do you kind of see yourselves in that? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that's right. I mean, we all kind of make our individual uh, choices. Um, you know, we all think about how we want to segment our customers, who we want to appeal to. I mean, uh, JetBlue has always I think, focused, as uh, right from David Newman when he created it, they, we don't think you should have to choose between low fares and great service. So we're going to find a way of running our airline. It's not easy, especially in New York, where, you know, costs tend to be higher to um, continue to uh, offer um, uh, all of the sort of um, product features that customers have come accustomed to. You know, the, they love our free live TV. They, our customers love our free Wi-Fi. They appreciate the extra legroom. Um, but we want to, you know, keep our, our, our fares down. And so um, that is, I think, how we truly differentiate ourselves. I think that's different to um, some of our competitors in this space who make different choices based on what they think the right business model for them. Uh, the wonderful thing is in the, you know, in the markets in the U.S. where it's competitive, then you have a lot of choice. Uh, and uh, you know, other other cities there isn't so much choice because you tend to have one dominant uh, airline. But um, for you know, for for many Americans, they can kind of uh, enjoy that. We have tremendous brand loyalty where we fly. I mean, uh, we um, really appreciate the uh, um, affinity that customers have for, for JetBlue and. Uh, you know, we we have people that were little kids flying us when we started 20 years ago, and uh, you know now they're uh, they're either at college or they've gone through college, or maybe even starting to have kids of their own, and they're still flying JetBlue 20 years later. And we just so appreciate that. You mentioned about you know the, the, the onboard service, the three uh, television and entertainment channels, and the, the three branded snacks. I mean, what's the reason? I mean, I know that was there from the beginning in the DNA of JetBlue, but what's the reason that you do offer that free even in in the, the, the coach or economy cabin when you could arguably make a you know more than a few bucks on that as a, as a stream of ancillary revenue? No, I mean, I think that, I mean, if we took away the blue chips, I, I think people would go crazy. I mean, I mean, it's so, it's so part of our core. I mean, John, we are an airline that, I mean, we've only been around 20 years, but we, we go back to our, um, you know, we go back to our roots a lot and we sort of uh, um, say, what are we about? I mean, you know, the founders, David Nilman, Dave Barger and others, when they created the airline, the first thing they did was to create the values safety, caring, integrity, passion, and fun. They did that before they had even bought an airplane or had a business plan. And, and so our culture is very important to us uh, and our commitment to our customers is important to us. And so, I mean, I think those are, those are the things that our brand is built on. And yes, we've had to adapt over the years. I mean, we, we had to start charging for bags. We had to um, start charging for, for change fees. You know, we had to adapt with the industry because you can't afford to offer all of this um all these uh, products and benefits uh, as the industry changes, but we try to hang on to what our customers uh, tell us is the most important. And what they tell us is the most important is the the um, in-flight service, our crew members, and our commitment to uh, their commitment to customer service, um, and then the extra legroom that they, they, they that they get on board. And so, you know, that's what we try and build our company around, and we try to stay true to that. I don't know which of those words you heard. I just muted myself temporarily by mistake. Yeah, I think it is interesting. That's the new thing of the year, isn't it? Uh, you're on mute. I don't think I ever said that before COVID. Exactly. But yeah. It's becoming the in word, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see that customer response because uh, both yourselves and Southwest, as I said, you you fall into that low cost bracket, which is hard to define anyway. And we've seen the, the network carriers downgrade their service. So it's almost become a an inverse uh, situation in the US, uh, perhaps more than we've seen seen over here. So, but it's good to know that customers value it. And I mean, your financial results arguably speak for themselves that uh, you're, you're delivering what you need prior to the coronavirus crisis uh, and delivering to customers. Another thing in terms of your, your very makeup, I mean, you, you call yourself, uh, I noticed it's a kind of a copyrighted uh, slogan, yet New York's hometown airline. I think it's very rare. I can't think of another airline that I've seen has used that tag, and of course, it's very powerful. Uh, but you, you also talk about the value of your geography. I mean, you started in New York. New York and Boston are your roots, but you've widened out dramatically from uh, domestic services in those cities to you know, uh, Florida and to California, as you said. 
just tell us a bit more about that because from the hometown origins to the wider reach and, and what do you mean when you talk yeah. about focus cities compared to any other base type city yeah so we use the term focus city rather than hub um because we are a point-to-point -point business so between 80 to 90 percent of our business um and it's honestly it's really between 85 to 90 percent of our business is point to point um so we don't uh we don't really build our network for connections, um, uh, particularly in New York. I mean, it is not, it's not an easy airport to connect through and we don't really want people to connect into it. Um, so we've, we've built on, we've built for point to point. So that uses the term. And, and I think if you, if you look back to when JetBlue was uh, created, it was very much based on uh, the Northeast of Florida. We have a tremendous franchise that represents about 30% of a cap capacity. We then started building um, sort of um, between 2005 onwards, we started building our Caribbean franchise. So we have a very strong network into the Caribbean now, again, out of the Northeast. Um, where we always had an area of weakness was on our Transcon business. And it was, you know, it, it was very important. I mean, um, but we couldn't make money on Transcon. And, so, and the reason we couldn't make money is we, we had a 20, 15, 20% unit revenue deficit to our competitors. And that was because we weren't carrying any of the higher value, um, you know, if you had the first class market. So we developed a product that we rolled out in 2014 called Mint. It's uh, an amazing um, uh, experience. It's flatbeds for everybody. It was a real, really pioneering in the US when we uh, came out with it. But again, in line with our low cost commitment, when we rolled it out, we weren't charging over $2,000 like our competitors were at the time. Uh, we started with a fair $599 and it really has changed the game on Transcom. It's raised everyone's product quality because they've had to compete with men. Uh, it's also brought the fares down, premium fares down about 50% on what they were before uh, JetBlue started flying men. Because of that, it's enabled us to build a very successful Transcom franchise as well. So if you look at the sort of the three, if you like, you know, every airline has a kind of network kind of that it's in its DNA. It's Northeast Florida, it's Northeast Caribbean, and it's Transcom. And then on top of that, we have a certain amount of short haul flying. Uh, we do out of New York and Boston, which is more aimed at the business market. And that makes up. Do you do that with the New York Boston shuttle? Is that part of the. Uh... Well, we do have a, we do have uh, we do have a, actually, you know, what we market is uh, we fly to all three New York airports from Boston. So we actually uh, have flights to JFK, LaGuardia and, and Newark. So what we say to customers is, you know, if you want to fly into Newark and out of LaGuardia, because maybe, you're, you're, you know, you've got two or three different meetings in New York, you know, we're your guy. Uh, and, um, you know, we're the, we have the largest uh, number of flights per day and number largest number of desti direct destinations by far. Uh, up in Boston. And it's, it's interesting what you said, you know, coming back to at the beginning when you talked about uh, JFK, because I, I remember, of course, at JFK, uh, many of the audience may not realise that airport did, as you said, have a lot of spare capacity in the past. It was primarily yeah, yeah. the intercontinental airport, as you would know from your BA days, many BA yeah. and other European US carrier flights yeah. to Europe, but enormous periods of time when not much was happening and I guess David Needham and the startup team saw that opportunity to yeah. use that capacity you've really made it your own and then bolting on yeah. the other two airports subsequently yeah correct I mean David used to say that you could uh, you could bowl a bowling ball down the JFK runway at uh, you know in the early afternoon because there was never, there was no one coming in and out and uh, you know David got a lot of support uh, particularly from uh, Senator Schumer back in the day um, now minority leader Schumer uh, we'll see if that changes after the Georgia runoffs. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, that's right. Build at JFK. And look, we, we, uh, we've managed to grow Newark. That's one of the things we've done during COVID. We've aggressively grown Newark. We have more flights out of Newark now than we did before the pandemic. Um, and, you know, LaGuardia, we, we, uh, if we could get more flights into LaGuardia, uh, we could do, I think, a spectacular job at uh, lowering fares uh, there as well. Fares at LaGuardia do... Um, you know, tend to be stubbornly, 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 can't speak, um, uh, are stubbornly high because, um, you know, there's just not enough JetBlue, low-cost JetBlue service to help keep the fares down. And I must ask as well, just by sheer coincidence, I did an interview uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, Rick Cotton, uh, Executive Director oh, of New York Port Authority, uh, so, you know, your yeah. partner in crime, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he acknowledged, you know, that the three airports in New York have not really given the best... Uh, 
image of New York over many years. I mean, yeah. I, in some ways, no fault of their own, but, but they've just that the, the market's so big that they they are, according to Rick, um, really working hard, starting a thing with LaGuardia to put that right with big yeah. investment in the infrastructure, maybe even expedited by the coronavirus uh, challenge and the need yeah. to change in technology. Is that something you're finding, Robin? Are you, are you happy yeah. with what you're able to offer your customers? Yeah, I mean, Rick, i got to say, you know, Rick came into that job and he made it his number one mission to, um, in, you know, begin the process of investing in infrastructure. Uh, him and his team, uh, Huntley and others, have done a great job. I mean, we've got a new terminal at LaGuardia that is largely open. Um, some gates still to open, but the head, you know, the, the main terminal building is open. I flew through it last week. It's beautiful. Um, uh, you know, new terminal going up at Newark that we'll be moving into. And, uh, you know, plans to develop JFK, including our own plans to, uh, uh, you know, build a larger facility there. So, uh, yeah, we really appreciate, everyone at JetBlue really appreciates everything Rick and the Port Authority uh, has, has done. That's good. Um, and in terms of um, development, you said you don't really uh, work for connections, but you have always been willing to have uh, a variety of code shares. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if these are all current, but I remember from some of my own uh, consultancy work, you, you have uh, code shared with Aer Lingus, for example, with Iceland, uh, with a lot mm -hmm. of air transatlantic activity through uh, uh, Reykjavik. Um, and of course, you just announced a, a bigger strategic partnership with one of those large network yeah. groups, with American, this yeah. summer. That one, it looks to me, will be a bit more focused on connections, and American is going to put some more uh, intercontinental flights out of JFK, which apparently they haven't done for some years, precisely yeah. because they'll be able to get more feed from yourselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And I should have clarified my comments. When I talked about connection, I was really sort of thinking domestic to domestic. Uh -huh. you, know, you, have, uh, you have legacy airlines who have built, that's their business model, right? They build these huge hubs that connect people um, both internationally and domestically. But yeah, we always have worked with uh, international partners. You know, that's a little bit easier for us because you tend to have higher minimum connecting time. So you're not sort of uh, so vulnerable to the sort of ground delay programs that, well, um, you know, uh, one of the one of the things with COVID is we haven't seen any grand delay programs in New York. I never thought I'd see that, but um, we haven't this year. But yeah, we so we work with a number of partners. Um, you named some of them, and uh, yeah, we're very excited about our partnership with uh, American Airlines. It's going to create a third, very powerful competitive force in New York, where between uh, what JetBlue has with our network and what American has and will add, you know, it'll allow us to uh, compete uh, more effectively with the two large global um, US carriers that have hubs, one at JFK and one at uh, Newark. In addition, you know, we will get access to more slots in New York that will allow us to do what we do best, which is add flights, improve service and reduce fares. And so I think um, it's really incredible opportunity for us. It's a great opportunity for American, but the real winners are the consumers who will just see uh, more JetBlue flights uh, and more lower fares. And, more connection opportunities uh, with American to add to what they already have on competitive airlines today. Now, now we talked about you know, you know the, the network in its broader sense. We talked about the coronavirus uh, crisis, but I noticed it in your recent uh, investor briefing, uh, uh, and um, I touched on this point with Michael Leary. Of course, in terms of planning a network, in terms of pricing your capacity, airlines normally have all sorts of data available, historical trends that are used in network yeah. planning, in revenue management. All of that has uh, been more or less uh, thrown on a scrap heap, at least for now, with, with no meaningful historic information. And uh, you've referred to that, you've talked about your, your booking window, tightening up, Michael Leary said the same uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, you've, you've said you've been much more opportunistic, and it seems to me that's important between the airlines that are going to make it through this crisis and come out the other side. One, having financial strength, which you've described, but the other is not thinking about the traditional way, being forced, but getting on and doing the thinking in a different way. Tell us a bit about yeah. how you're managing that, the opportunism and the challenges when things yeah. are not going in patterns as you'd expect. Yeah, no, it's been interesting. You know, nimble is definitely the new word of 2020 uh, in terms of uh, reacting quickly to uh, things. I mean, um, you know, not not only uh, are we in a sort of a very uncertain environment, but I mean, the, the, the fact that we allow customers now to change flights without uh, a cancellation penalty means that, you know, no show rates have gone up as well. And so um, there's a whole layer of uncertainty in the planning process that we've had to 
adapt to. And it takes, you know, it takes two or three months, I think, to, to bed it in and get it right. But I feel now that we are, you know, we're looking at things uh, and responding to them. So we've, you know, we've announced over 60 new routes during this uh, pandemic. I never thought I'd see new 60 new routes in a, a, a year. I never thought I'd see more than 10. And uh, yet we've done 60 and there's probably more more to come. So I think the other the other thing that helped us, though, is we had started the process, again, like other airlines, of, of moving the revenue management cons- uh, process of identifying demand trends away from historical demand, as you quite rightly said um, earlier, um, is what it, they traditionally based on. We are largely direct. You know, the vast majority of our customers book directly. So we have a lot of looks data every day that for people coming to our website. We can see what they're searching. We can see their response to different uh, fares that we put out there. And so that does give us, I think, a little bit more of a real-time pulse because if we see a, a particular interest in destination, um, but maybe the conversion rates aren't where we would like them to be. It might be telling us the fare might be a little bit high. So if we were to bring the fare down, can we st- stimulate more demand? So we've got a lot better at the um, uh, interfaces between our sort of data analytics and our web teams into revenue management. And I think that's been a good thing. There's always things I think you learn during the, an event like this that allow you to sort of change your company for the better, and I think that's that's going to be one of them for us, and I'm sure the same for other airlines. Well, I, th- I think what you say there, Robin, I mean, the whole digital thing, we didn't have this. If this had happened, no. I don't know, even five years ago, it would have been hard, 10, 20 no. years ago, we no. wouldn't have had this means to have a clue who yeah. was looking where. And I speak as a you know, former revenue management guy myself, uh, so I find that fascinating now that yeah. there is an ability to see exactly what people would like to do, even yeah. if you're not offering it, and that must help yeah. you in the experiments to get a higher success rate. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely right. And, um, you know, uh, I think the uh, investment we've made in um, areas like machine learning and, and, you know, data analytics, I mean, um, they've really helped us, um, you know, they've really helped us, I think, change the timeline. I mean, it was a multi-month process historically for us to identify a new market, go down and go negotiate the landing fees and everything else, train everybody, get hire people, I mean, we've condensed that right down to weeks so that if we see an opportunity, uh, we can quickly go in there, get a team on the ground, uh, launch service. And because the booking curve has come in so much, it actually means that we can ramp up much more quickly. If we pick the right destination at the right time, uh, we can actually ramp up much more quickly than we could have done because the booking curve has, has come in. That's remarkable. Now, Robin, the moment's come. Uh, you've got the London chart behind you. Uh, oh, yeah. This, to me, is a big one of this uh, conversation. Uh, I mentioned to you before we started, I want to give you uh, the third degree, if that's the right way to put it, on the London route. I mean, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember hearing you speak in London. I can't remember it was last oh. year or the year before the Aviation Club. Uh, you, you'd already gone public on your, your plans to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you said you will delay, but still, we are talking about next year. Uh, and, of course, it's not surprising any other yeah, would delay a big new step in this kind of crisis but the London market from New York and indeed from Boston um, is, a, is a large one mm-hmm. it's one if played in the right way is a rich and lucrative one but it's just changed dramatically well it's, it's hardly in existence I mean airlines are operating yeah. flights but with normal yeah. numbers of passengers at the moment yeah. tell yeah. us a bit more about this I've got a whole list of questions to put myself but uh, <laughs> start us off on your your thinking on this and has it changed yeah. because of the situation we find ourselves in? Yeah. So um, we, um, uh, first of all, you know, what we saw as the opportunity uh, before all of this broke was that, we, you know, we, as we know, as you know, John, the, yes, there's a lot of service between places like London, New York, but, but the fares are extremely high. And when we look at what we did with our mid-service back in uh, 2014, where we started between LA and JFK, we were able to bring a better product to market and slash, I'll use the word slash, slash the fare. Uh, so we just, we see the same opportunity to, to fly to London to, again, it's a huge market. Um, even some, excuse me, <coughs> even some lowering of the fare uh, will have a, a you know, a, a stimulation effect. Um, and we plan to make some very, very significant downward adjustments to premium fares. And uh, um, so, you know, we, we feel really confident about the opportunity. It's the largest market out of uh, New York and Boston that we don't fly to today. So it's something that our customers are 
asking us a lot for. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a problem with life. Uh, life. Uh, yeah, have, have, have a sip of water. And uh, so you started talking about London. I started choking up. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> thoughts of home, thoughts of us. So, uh, so you know that that was the that's the opportunity. So we still see it's there. So the question is, okay, is it going to be there next year post coronavirus? We think it is. I mean, we think that by the time we get to next summer, that there is going to be this tremendous pent up demand for travel. We all know people in our own social circles who are desperate to get away, desperate to go and see family, but they just want to wait a little bit longer to feel more comfortable about flying. And so, you know, when we think about our 2021, our own planning assumption is that all of our leisure travel will be largely recovered by the end of 2021. Uh, and that by the, we expect to have a very strong summer. So we, we actually think launching uh, flights to London next summer, um, probably in Q3, is actually the perfect time to introduce uh, all of my friends in the UK and in Europe to... Uh, what I consider the uh, very positive effects of uh, flying JetBlue. You're going to have amazing experience. We're going to disrupt what people are used to in the front of the airplane. We're also working on an amazing experience for core, our coach customers, we call it core, um, but also giving people uh, a much, much cheaper way to fly uh, between the UK and the US. Now, it's interesting you, you, in two respects that you say the ability to offer a lower premium fares because you know this is a, a big market. It's, it's been a crowded market. We see airlines who've come in with uh, great new products for, for price-led customers, primary, primarily in the economy cabin, wonderful aircraft equipment. I'm thinking in particular yep. of players like Norwegian you know, at this very moment. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about their future. And he, if they manage to make it through the next few months, uh, they may not actually return to much of any of their long haul flights. So as, as you know, better than most from your BA experience, there is that challenge at the, the low end prices. The, the top end prices, and again, BA, we've both been there, British Airways, and seen those chock-a-block cabins of uh, club class passengers, right. maybe uh, more than 100 a flight at top dollar fares. But at the moment, that's just vanished. And it's, you know, that vanishing of that core traffic, which is so fundamental to an airline like BA or indeed a Lufthansa. Um, and we see the retirement of some of their large wide-bodied aircraft, suggesting we don't think it's going to come back. But I do wonder, um, I'm feeding you, I hope, the right line here, Robin. I do <laughs> wonder if, if you're exactly your philosophy of fares at the top end of a premium end are going to be yeah. much lower. Oh, yeah. Uh, some, some business traffic is going to come back. And then this whole thing about business travel, will, will, when I looked, uh, I haven't yeah. yet just to fly any product, when I, when I look at it and see the pictures of the seats, even some of them, you know, are really enclosed little cabins, I thought mm. maybe this is even another benefit that you, you could exploit. Mm. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, John. We, and we haven't actually shared what our uh, Europe, uh, European uh, service is going to be. We will no. be doing that shortly, uh, but we are you know, going to significantly uh, enhance what we already offer. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very excited about that. And, you know, again, I, 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 sh I shouldn't and I can't talk about, you know, how we would price this uh, product, but I will point to what we did back in 2014 between uh, JFK and LAX, where the fares at the time were, as a matter of course, $2,100, $2,200, and we rolled out men at $599. And so, you know, we want to have a profound effect. We, we want part of our legacy on the North Atlantic to be uh, that this is the airline that came along and profitably uh, brought premium fares down for everyone for good. And I always say to people, you don't fly JetBlue, fine, you're going to enjoy a lower fare flying one of our competitors because that's what we do. So it's going to take us some time to ramp up into that, obviously, because we'll start cautiously. And, uh, you know, we are, before this pandemic, we are a very profitable airline. London actually represents a relatively small portion of our total uh, capacity. Uh, and, and, you know, another thing, we're flying narrow-bodied airplanes. We aren't flying wide-bodies. And so the, the um, you know, investment of, of a new service like this is, of course, much lower. 
um, when you're not trying to feel wide body. I was going to say that's another important part of it, isn't it? I mean, we've yeah. seen the, these large aircraft, the venerable uh, 747. I'm sure you shed a tear, yeah. uh, as I certainly did with PA retiring there. 747s, yeah. oh, but oh. these new, uh, highly efficient, uh, long range yeah. carrier bodies for 321 in yeah. particular, uh, it, it, it looks like it's going to be a game changer. You've got 321s already, but I think I'm not sure if you've got you've got NEOs, but you're going to have the LR and the XLR, which allow you the maximum capability long range of those aircraft. Correct, yeah, we have um, we have um, 26 LRs and XLRs uh, on order and. Uh, um, yeah, th those are really designed around our sort of uh, plans for our European uh, footprint over time. And it won't just be London, I guess. You indicated, uh, I'm not pumping you for yeah. secret stuff, you've indicated you look at other large European cities. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess Paris is another natural uh, in terms of volume. Um, how far do you think you would go with that? What, would you look at secondary cities uh, around yeah. Europe? I mean, in the UK, you know, cities like Manchester or uh, Birmingham yeah. have long wanted and had some North yeah. Atlantic flights, but they've never been terribly long lasting. Yeah. Now, you may remember that uh, that 767 with the uh, the old Club World product that BA used to have on between uh, JFK and Manchester. Manchester. Right? I think that went around 2008, 2009 for memory. But yeah, I think um, that's right. And I think the other benefit of a um, is uh, when we think about the seasonality of our business. So there's a number of markets, regional secondary cities that we know will perform extremely strongly in the summer, which, which we could fly seasonally. Then in the winter, you know, we'll point the airplanes uh, domestically or we'll point them into mm -hmm. Caribbean. We, we have our mint service into multiple Caribbean markets and it really does very well. Um, Barbados, uh, St. Martin, uh, Aruba, many others. And so we already have been doing that uh, where we will sort of uh, move things around season. And that is one of the benefits of a, a North American operator with now bodied equipment. You know, there are um, a lot more things. It, it's not as a seasonal business as it is in Europe, as you see, John, where you, you know, mm -hmm. have the difference between the summer, to, summer winter performance. Oh, I think that's a, a critical element, isn't it? You've yeah. got to be able to, one, this aircraft you can do, I mean, I, theoretically, it's not built for, you can do a short flight, like, I don't know, New York, Boston, and then you could do a long haul on the next sector, and that's an amazing uh, step yeah. forward compared to many yeah, I mean, it really, yeah, the, I mean, the LR really is just a fuel tank. I mean, a couple of other things, but, so, you know, we want to add, we want to fly on an additional transcon. I mean, it's not we're buying a different fleet type. It's not that we need a different pilot group. It's not that we need different simulators. I mean, mm. Again, how do we keep our costs low? Yeah, we do it in a way that makes these uh, these incremental investments very small. So, um, look, I see a, ultimately a few years down the line, I see a world where we have a number of all year round markets to Europe because they perform a year round, and there'll be a num number of uh, uh, seasonal markets. And then in the winter, we'll we'll point um, we'll point the airplanes at, at things that we do today, like the Caribbean, which tends to um, soak up a lot of capacity, a lot of premium capacity in the peak winter months. I was just wondering, I, I, I had it as a, a separate item, I mean, the, the, the fleet as a whole is a modern fleet. You've had a dual fleet strategy to now with 320s and Embraer 190s. You're going to move out of the Embraer 190 into the A220 or what, what was originally the Bombardier C series. Even that has now got an amazing set of credentials. Uh, and I think that can do, uh, uh, I don't know about the payload, it can do an East Coast Europe, uh, which uh, was unheard of before in a meaningful yeah. way for regional jet. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're excited about that. I mean, um, we've had a, a long um, partnership with Airbus. They've been a really, uh, you know, good partner uh, for over 20 years. I mean, JetBlue was going to be a Boeing airline until Airbus turned up. Uh, and um, uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the re uh, retiring of our 190 fleet replacement of the 220s, our first 220 will arrive here next month. So we're excited to, uh, to see we have 70, uh, 70 220s on order. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, again, um, whilst we have made $2 billion of capital deferred, capex, uh, capital expenditure deferrals uh, because of the coronavirus pandemic, um, you know, we are still committed to the 220 uh, replacement of the 190 because it drives a significant amount of, uh, you know, operating margin improvement for us uh, going forward. And just back specifically, a bit, a bit more to run on, on, the, on the transatlantic, uh, Robin. I mean, no one's going to welcome you with open arms. And we've seen in numerous right. situations of competition. I mean, other competitors are not going to welcome yeah. you with open arms, is, I should say, to be more correct. No. Um, 
<laughs> and what's your, your feeling about that? I mean, you've been you've been on both sides of the tracks. You've seen yeah. how these battles play out. Uh, you've got not just the firepower with you know, some of these groups uh, with their large frequencies and their joint ventures and their alliances, but the range of products and, and, and maybe the buy-in as well in the corporate travel market. Uh, and, and you're not known at the moment on this side of the Atlantic. So yeah. you've got the strength on the US side, but you've got you've got to counter those elements to, to yeah. break your way in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we're really based again. First of all, uh, just a reminder that we're flying uh, narrow bodied equipment. So we, yeah. uh, you know, we, we don't need very much to, uh, uh, to be very successful. Uh, I think the stimulation of the market uh, that we will do by the fare reductions we have in mind uh, will, you know, more than, uh, you know, offset what we need. But we, we're basing this on a, um, a European point of sale, uh, sorry, on a US point of sale uh, model. Uh, we have a number of partners that we'll, we'd be partnering on this flight with in terms of a uh, interline or code share um, partner. Um, and obviously we have a, a, an extremely extensive amount of frequent flyers in our True Blue program, both in New York and Boston. So, um, and we have some corporate customers as well. And again, when we did mint in the um, uh, transcom between uh, JFK and LAX, nearly said Heathrow and LAX there, but JFK and LAX, um, it was largely uh, leisure customers that we built it for. We didn't, we saw a little bit of small, medium sized corporate traffic because they weren't getting any discounts, but we didn't get a lot of big corporates on it. Uh, and to give you a sense, John, of how successful it was, we originally were going to do 11 mint airplanes. Mm. Uh, then we said, okay, let's do 13 because it's going rather well. We now have 35. Wow. And honestly, if I could wave a magic wand and do something different, uh, I would have even more of those airplanes and maybe less airplanes that are all uh, coach or all core. So, um, and, and we make mint work to markets where they've never had flatbed service before, and yet it works. And so, uh, it's a combination of the airplane, it's a combination of our brand, and it's a combination of our incredible people. I mean, our Mint flight, in-flight crew members that work Mint, um, they are amazing. And if we, when we look at our, I mean, I'm not used to reading customer service where most customers are scoring their airline 10 out of 10 in the category. Uh, but when, it, when they're sort of describing the service they get from our crew members in Mint, they're scoring us regularly 10 out of 10. And so that just builds tremendous tremendous loyalty over time so yeah the you know the big guys will get out their big guns and they've got all sorts of tools and levers but you know we've been uh, we've been um we've been weaving around them here for 20 years we have never really been welcomed by open arms we've had lots of uh, um uh, attempts over the years to try to limit what JetBlue has been able to do but we've always found a way to compete uh, and bring our amazing product and our amazing people to market and I mentioned you know, the challenges of long or low cost, which is not what you're proposing. And conversely, we did have a, a run, as you'll recall, when we had I think we had three uh, all business class airlines flying to London yeah. from New York. Yeah. Differences in their products and they, a couple yeah. of Luton and one was at Stansted, and they all keeled over more or less about the time yes. of the financial crisis. Uh, I suppose uh, that's written large in your your, your psyche to uh, avoid uh, the, the challenges that put them out of business. Yeah, I mean, again, I think what they didn't have um, um, was uh, the brand in the market already. They certainly didn't have the sort of customer loyalty. So they were starting flights and they didn't have really anything. Knew about them. Yeah, no one knew about them. And I mean, again, we have millions and millions of customers in our frequent fly program here in the Northeast. We have corporate accounts. We have existing airline partners. And so... Um, um, I mean, we're actually very cautious. I mean, um, we, we, we are very, we've thought a lot about this. We could have actually started this probably a year or two earlier if we really had wanted to, but we wanted to spend our time. And, um, you know, I think our success with Mint um, uh, gives me every confidence in the world. And, you know, by the way, John, if it, if it doesn't work and, um, you know, all we'll do is we'll take the fuel tank out of the airplanes and we'll fly them somewhere else. So the, the downside risk for us is, is close to zero. But, um, you know, we are 100% committed to this. We're 100% confident uh, that, that, it will, that it will work. I mean, when we can make Mint work multiple flights a day to multiple East Coast cities that never had flatbed service before, and suddenly they're full and it's profitable and we're adding even more flights because people are talking about Mint. Um, I mean, I, I was called by um, uh, um, 
uh, uh, my wife was called by a, a catering company the other day who was doing an event for someone and they were like, okay, I want to, I want to serve like uh, JetBlue mint mills. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the whole loyalty around the mint brand and, and what we deliver, I think we are so excited to take that to the next level and then putting on an airplane and bringing it to the United Kingdom. It's, it's, it certainly does seem that it, in a strange way, this coronavirus is a catalyst to be the right moment. And I know you haven't announced exactly the mint product uh, for yeah. Transatlantic, but seeing those images of those aircraft with closed doors and privacy and wondering what people are thinking in the future, I think that's going to help. Yeah. I have got to ask you a million dollar question. I, I don't know, I can't remember what you said publicly <laughs> about which London airport or which yeah. London airport. So I, my sources tell me, I think you have yeah. now applied and got slots for Stansted and Gatwick, I bet you've yeah. not gotten for Heathrow, but it seems to me if you wanted Heathrow, which again, arguably would be the majority of the crowd. Mm. Although people are filing historic slots for next year, I can't see that's all going to happen again. You might be able to get all three if you so wished. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to say too much on that now because uh, um, I think... Work in uh, progress, I guess. Uh, I think Emily, uh, who is in the team, will get very cross with me. Um, but, you know, I will say what I've said, that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make an announcement when we are ready to sort of uh, put the flights on sale um, and... Um, uh, we're we're com very confident we have a path into more than one London uh, airport, and and we're excited about what we're thinking of doing. And whatever you do, not to put words in your mouth, but as you described about the size of a New York catchment and what the different airports mm -hmm. can do, I mean, obviously London's a different version of that. So mm -hmm. uh, lots of yeah. potential there. I won't try to force you any more on that. But I yeah, and I, so we're, we're not flying wide bodies, so again, you know, exactly. But some of the uh, other London airports that have. Um, in the past, maybe been underserved to the US. I mean, they, it starts to look very different in when you have a, a different uh, solution like a narrow-bodied airplane. So, uh, you know, look, sometimes JetBlue goes with the flow, sometimes we go against the wind, uh, depending on what we think is gonna work the best. So we'll, we're looking forward to showing uh, what we're thinking about in, uh, in due course. Fantastic, we look forward to that, Robin. We've only got about five minutes left, uh, and uh, just, uh... I'm just looking at questions from the audience. Uh, I think we've covered them actually. We talked about, you said you would have partnerships, uh, interline partnerships to feed more traffic into whatever points you come to in Europe. We've talked about business traffic and the, yeah, the mint product, people are interested in that. I think that's been well covered. Last quick couple of questions for you. The elections happened. We, we, we're still waiting with all this rather unusual situation this time around in the US to get absolute clarity on the result. It seems pretty clear. What are your thoughts about if there is a change of uh, administration? Would, would that be a, a good or bad thing or is it a different thing for you in JetBlue and for the airline industry? Yeah. Well, you know, having come from the UK and living in the US, I, I always try to think about the, the, the differences of the two systems. And of course, when there's a you know, in the, in the UK, the, the, an election's announced, it's all over in four weeks, there's a winner, and the next day the winner's in Downing Street. Um, they're certainly not counting the votes for uh, days and weeks. So, uh, yeah, it is a, so we don't know the answer yet. It looks, obviously, that it's going to be a change of administration um, in the White House. Um, the, it looks like, obviously, in the House, um, the Democrats will stay in control with a smaller um, majority, and then the, the Senate is the unknown, where... The Republicans go in uh, having maintained the Senate, but there's two runoff seats in Georgia. If they go both Democrat, it's a 50-50 tie. And then the vice president, um, assuming it's uh, Harris, uh, will then break the tie. So the Senate would, would flip as well. But whatever the outcome here, clearly it's a very, um, uh, it's a bipartisan, you know, what, the, what effectively the people have voted for is a change of president, but a bipartisan Congress. And so, um, I think we've worked with uh, Democrat administrations, Republicans, we have relationships across the aisle. And I was very encouraged during the CARES Act because what I think both um, Republicans and Democrats really appreciate and value is the role aviation plays in both supporting so many jobs and also economic growth. And so I think that um, I'm um, uh, you know, optimistic about whichever, however the cards fall here, um, it'll be, you know, it'll be a good opportunity for the industry to continue to come out of this. And, you know, number one priority for the industry here is a follow-up to the CARES Act, uh, follow-up CARES Act bill. Uh, it got stalled. It got caught up in all the sort of, I think, the politics that goes around an election. But uh, again, there's both, there's good support for both Republicans and Democrats. And so number one priority is to get that passed. 
um, ensure the industry can come through all of this, uh, protect as many jobs as we can. And then I think, um, you know, once we got through that, we'll, we'll see what's, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see what's next. I mean, um, uh, I, you know, I expect other priorities of a Democrat administration will be things like sustainability. Uh, that's very important for JetBlue. You know, we were the first airline in the U.S. to announce our plans to uh, go to um, uh, carbon uh, carbon neutral growth. Um, and um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll wait and see. But uh, um, um, number one priority is the CARES Act and and trying to get a follow up extension so that we can protect as many jobs as we can in industry. Yeah, I mean, certainly for not only for you in the US, but everywhere, it's going to be a tough winter. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Not everybody's going to make it. Um, good to hear that both parties, whenever this is finally resolved, are cognizant of the importance of aviation and uh, it's going to be a, a, a supportive environment in one way or another. And even on the question I was going to ask you about sustainability of the environment, uh, you've answered anyway. Uh, and that again is becoming an issue for airlines yeah. worldwide. Yeah. Robin, I think we've had a, a good uh, coverage of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I've enjoyed speaking to you and uh, I'm really looking forward to interest when you come up with your next uh, full fleshing out of a transatlantic proposal next year. Hopefully that's going to be something to look forward to in 2021 as we're all going to be pretty eager to brush 2020 behind us under the carpet yeah. and what it's done to all of us in every way. So. Robin, yeah. thanks very much for your time today. It's been a fascinating discussion. Um, this is going to be available to all of you on demand to watch after. Uh, we wish you all the best for your working day, uh, Robin, and uh, we'd like to get you back in person in the future. Yeah, great. Uh, that concludes our second uh, aviation uh, seminar for this year. So over and out for me. Hopefully next time around we'll be in person. So enjoy the rest of WTM virtual. Thanks very much again, Robin. Thanks very much to you, ladies and gentlemen. And it's goodbye from me, John Strickland. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.